Mr. William Rosin, of the parish of St. Catherine, is somewhat stricken in years and married to a young widow who has very much the ascendant over him. This degenerate age being so perverted in all things that, even in the state of matrimony, the young pretend to govern their elders. The musician is extremely fond of her, but is often obliged to lay by his fiddle to hear louder notes of hers when she is pleased to be angry with him. For you are to know Will is not of consequence enough to enjoy her conversation, but when she chides him or makes use of him to carry on her amours. For she is a woman of stratagem, and even in that part of the world where one would expect but very little gallantry, by the force of natural genius, she could be sullen, sick, out of humour, splenetic, want new clothes and more money, as well as if she'd been bred in Cheapside or Cornhill. She was lately under a secret discontent on account of a lover she was like to lose by his marriage, for her gallant Mr Ezekiel Boniface had been twice asked in church in order to be joined in matrimony with Mrs Winifred Dimple, spinster of the same parish. Hereupon Mrs Rosin was far gone in that distemper, which well-governed husbands know by the description of I am, I know not how. And Will soon understood that it was his part to inquire into the occasion of her melancholy, or suffer as to the cause of it himself. After much importunity, all he could get out of her was that she was the most unhappy and the most wicked of all women, and had no friend in the world to tell her grief to. Upon this, Will doubled his importunities, but she said that she should break her poor heart if he did not take a solemn oath that he would not be angry, and that he would expose the person who had wronged her to all the world for the ease of her mind, which was no way else to be quieted. Our fiddler was so melted that he immediately kissed her and afterwards the book. When his oath was taken, she began to lament herself and revealed to him that, miserable woman as she was, she had been false to his bed. Will was glad to hear that it was no worse, but before he could reply, Nay, said she, I will make you all the atonement I can, and take shame upon me by proclaiming it to all the world, which is the only thing that can remove my present terrors of mind. This was indeed too true, for her design was to prevent Mr Boniface's marriage, which was all she apprehended. Will was thoroughly angry, and began to curse and swear, the ordinary expressions of passion in persons of his condition, upon which his wife, Oh, William, how well you mind the oath you have taken, and the distress of your poor wife, who can keep nothing from you. I hope you won't be such a perjured wretch as to forswear yourself. The fiddler answered that his oath obliged him only not to be angry at what was past. But I find you intend to make me laughed at all over whopping. No, no, replied Mrs. Rosen. I see well enough what you would be at, you poor-spirited cuckold. You are afraid to expose Boniface, who had abused your poor wife, and would fain persuade me still to suffer the stings of conscience. But I assure you, Sirrah, I won't go to the devil for you. Poor Will was not made for contention, and beseeching her to be pacified, desired she would consult the good of her soul her own way, for he would not say her nay in anything. Mrs. Rosin was so very loud and public in her invectives against Boniface that the parents of his mistress forbade the bands, and his match was prevented, which was the whole design of this deep stratagem. The father of Boniface brought his action of defamation, arrested the fiddler, and recovered damages. This was the distress from which he was relieved by the company, and the good husband's air, history, and jollity upon his enlargement gave occasion to very much mirth, especially when Will, finding he had friends to stand by him, proclaimed himself a cuckold by way of insult over the family of the Bonifaces. Here is a man of tranquillity without reading Seneca. What work had such an incident made among persons of distinction? The brothers and kindred of each side must have been drawn out and hereditary hatreds entailed on the families as long as their very names remained in the world. Who would believe that Herod, Otello, and Will Rosin were of the same species?
This puts me in mind of a passage in the admirable poem called The Dispensary, where the nature of true honour is artfully described in an ironical dispraise of it. But ere we once engage in honour's cause, first know what honour is and whence it was. Scorned by the base, tis courted by the brave, the hero's tyrant and the coward's slave. Born in the noisy camp, it lives on air, and both exists by hope and by despair. Angry when e'er a moment's ease we gain, and reconciled at her returns of pain. It lives when in death's arms the hero lies, but when his safety he consults, it dies. Bigoted to this idol, we disclaim rest, health and ease, for nothing but a name.